classmates. Welcome everyone to our first Women's Her Story research presentation. Um, this is also a collaboration between the Women's Center and Women's and Gender Studies. Um, so the Women's and Gender Studies program does a brown bag series, so approximately once a month, um, they'll host different scholars. Um, and this month we are hosting our very own director of the Women's and Gender Studies program, Dr. Ula Klein, and she is going to share with us about her recently published book, Sapphic Crossings. Um, so Dr. Klein, I will turn it over to you to enlighten us. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm super excited to be here and to be presenting about my book, uh, which which just came out in February of this year. So, um, I mean, the work on it was, you know, I would say because it started as my dissertation, so I would say it's about 10 years in in the making. Uh, so it's exciting to finally have it out uh, and available um, for everyone to read. So I'm going to just introduce myself and um, on the next slide here to give you a little bit of background about myself and then I'll kind of launch into the book just in case anyone's still joining us. So uh, so here's me on my graduation day for my PhD and that's my wife um, and it is relevant. I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, so this is kind of my educational background. Um, I did my PhD in English uh, with a specialization in 18th century British literature, and that's the time period that my book focuses on. Uh, so if you think about kind of American Revolution, uh, French and Indian War, Seven Years War, um, Robinson Crusoe, right? If you're familiar with any of those, that's, that's all 18th century. Uh, but I did do a graduate certificate in women's and gender studies while I was at Stony Brook University, and that really kind of got me interested even more so into digging into um, women's history and gender and sexuality studies in particular. Um, and so after various perambulations around this great nation of ours, I did end up here at UWO, just started in August. And so it's been a little strange starting a new job in a pandemic, um, but uh, so far everyone that I have been able to meet has been very, very welcoming and I'm very excited about my role here. Um, and I just I chose my picture here, you know, as a background of my scholarly uh, educational background, but also because uh, whenever we work as scholars, especially in the history of sexuality, our own identity is going to impact how we look at a text. Uh, and that might be true in a in a broader sense as well, but certainly in the history of sexuality. Um, so my book is called Sapphic Crossings, and Sapphic was the primary word used for female same-sex desire in the 18th century. Um, and that's that's important because obviously coming from someone who's in a female same-sex relationship, uh, that is going to inform what uh, I look at and how I think about the texts that I read. Um, and it's going to kind of prioritize that identity as I read. So that is something that I'm just going to put out there as part of my kind of uh, the stakes of my project for myself. Um, so female cross-dressing in 18th century literature, uh, that is kind of the, the subtitle right of my book and it is the topic. Um, and I'm going to start us off with talking about Hannah Snell, who was well known in the middle of the 18th century as a female soldier. I'm going to talk a little bit about her story and kind of talk about how she's a touchstone throughout the book. Uh, so you so can. Wow. Sorry. Keep going. Okay, sorry, I thought I heard a question. Um, so this is actually one of many images that circulated in the 18th century of Hannah Snell. Uh, and this particular image shows her in her regimentals performing a manual exercise of the soldier at a playhouse at a, a, on stage called Goodman's Field Wells in 1750. Uh, and this is right around the same time that a biography of her adventures, her life and adventures as a female Marine in disguise uh, aboard a British ship was published and it became very, very popular. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how it circulated and why that's important to my project. But I thought this was really interesting to start off an image um, kind of fully in her, let's say, disguise, quote unquote. So 
There are more images of Hannah Snell here, uh, and some of them might seem more like the one that's on the cover of my book. Um, and then one of them is obviously very, very different. And what I find really interesting is that her story circulated in various forms, and there were many, many images of her that circulated at this time as well. One of the earliest publications of her story as a woman who disguised herself in men's clothing and joined the female, uh, the British Marines because her husband had left her and she heard later that he had been um, pressed into service, that he had been recruited against his will almost to serve in the British Marines. And so she decided after their child dies that she is going to go and find him, right, because he abandoned her. So that's the story that is told um, and it shows up in this popular publication called the gentleman's magazine in 1750 in a very abbreviated form and then it kind of gets told over and over again in other publications so that eventually you could buy almost like a longer version that looked kind of like a novel in some ways and then there was sort of a shorter version almost like a short story version that you could buy more cheaply and there are so many images of her as well um, the, the one in the middle on this slide is perhaps the most well known. And then there were other artists who would redo the image, right? And so the one on the left is kind of a colorized version of the image in the middle. Um, and then there were as other images of her, like the one on the previous slide where she's um, doing the exercises with the gun. And then the one on the right here um, where she appears very kind of full body and a little bit maybe more androgynous or more masculine. Um, and what's interesting is that people could buy these images and kind of put them up in their house, right? Because it was uh, done as an engraving that could be printed several times uh, and so that you could buy it more cheaply. And of course, the colorized version would have been more expensive. So we see already that the story is circulating in cheaper versions and more expensive versions. Is the images are circulating in cheaper versions and more expensive versions. And for me, thinking about the popularity of the figure of the cross-dressing woman in the 18th century, this is really important. And it's one of the things that got me thinking early on in the project. What did people know about women who dressed in men's clothing? What did they think about them? What did they think about their desires? What did they think about their gender identity? And did they enjoy stories about women who dressed in men's clothing and, and pretended to be men? And what did they think about their motivations? So I was really interested in how her story circulated in text. I was interested in her as a person as well, uh, but I found some interesting kind of uh, differences between how she's represented in text and how her real life played out. And of course, as a scholar coming out of literary studies, this is kind of important. Right, that the difference between representation, which kind of lives on past the reality of the person uh, versus the, the reality of her life. So this is an image from the original publication, The Gentleman's Magazine, and here Snell looks a lot more masculine, I would say, which is interesting. That's another kind of element uh, I think that bears a little bit more discussion. Um, the images of her that are look more feminine versus more masculine. But this was one of the, the first places that her story appears. It appears in a magazine, which means it circulates a lot. A lot of people would have seen her story. A lot of people would have read it in a popular magazine. So I have some interesting quotes here that I wanted to share with you. And again, this was one of the earliest texts that I read when I was starting to think about 18th century literature and gender. And it, this is one of the texts that got me into thinking about female crossdressers or women who crossdress in the 18th century. Um, and one of the quotes from the text that comes up over and over again is this first one here, that she might execute her designs with the better grace and the more success. She boldly commenced a man, at least in her dress, and no doubt she had a right to do so since she had the real soul of a man in her breast. Now, to me, this quote is so amazing because it's packed with layers and layers of meaning that we can kind of unravel. Um, and this, this idea of like a real soul of a man in her breast, I mean, that points to kind of 18th century ideas about gender, um, that, that gender had to do not just with body parts, but it had to do a lot with behavior. It had to do with personality, right? It, 
in the 18th century, many people thought of women as the weaker sex, uh, as being also weak minded, as being um, incapable of higher level thinking, of being intelligent, of being educated like a man, uh, or of even being as brave as a man, even though clearly there was a lot of discussion about masculinity at this time. Um, just in general, and, and the female crossdresser, her as a kind of cultural touchstone at this time, comes to enter those discussions about what makes a man, what makes masculinity, masculinity. Uh, so this idea that she had a right to dress in men's clothing and to assume the role of a man because she had the real soul of a man in her breast because she was so brave, it's a fascinating idea. And again, it was one of the early elements of, of the readings that I did that made me think, well, what's going on with gender in the 18th century? And how does that relate to desire? How does that relate to sexuality and, and sexual desire? And, and this leads me to the next kind of interesting part of her story, where we learn that she and, and her ship, they land in Portugal, and she and her mate Jeffries meet uh, two young women in Lisbon, the handsomest of which was the favorite of our heroine. We're told quite early on again in her story that there was a way that she appealed in her soldier's outfit to other women who didn't know that she was a woman. So to me right away, ding, 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 ding. I'm so interested in thinking, what is going on? Why do these women find the female soldier so attractive? Is it because she's kind of embodying a certain kind of masculinity, a perfect ideal masculinity? Or is it because she is kind of androgynous? Is there something about her androgynousness that is appealing to these women? Or is it her femininity that appeals to these women? Um, why is she so appealing to them? The end of her story ends with this final quote here. I shall now conclude with informing the public that she still continues to wear her regimentals, but how she intends to dispose of herself or when, if ever, to change her dress is more than what she at present seems certain of. So the narrator ends her story by saying that she's still dressing in her soldier's outfit um, and we don't know when she's going to change back into women's clothing um, and, and it leaves this possibility open. And I, when I read, I like to look for possibilities, for interpretive possibilities. And the ambiguousness, the openness of the possibility here um, is, is really kind of fruitful to consider. Because when I looked into her real life, when I looked into Snell's actual life, eventually um, she opens a pub, which I think was called the Female Warrior. Uh, and she's successful for a while, uh, but after a while, she she doesn't she doesn't continue with the pub. She gets married again. Uh, she dresses in women's clothing, and by the end of her life, she's actually a pauper, and and she's she dies in quite reduced circumstances, um, and and with ill health. Um, now we do know that her story of serving in the British Marines was true because in the archives. Uh, other researchers have found proof that the British uh, government actually did pay her, the Crown paid her a pension as if she was just any other soldier or, or Marine, anyone who had served um, in the British um, military. So that, that we have a written record. We know this was a real person who actually did um, dress as a man and, and serve in the British Marines, serve aboard ships, serve in all these battles, and came back and, and said, hey, I was actually a woman, but I did all this, and, and they paid her because she had served her time. Um, but the text, the text is where I kind of come back because there's so many more opportunities there for thinking about possibilities, right? So when we think about her life story, we can't go back in time and say, well, you know, what did you really think about yourself when you were dressed as a man? Was that, you know, would you consider yourself transgender or were you interested in these women? And, and are you a lesbian or are you bisexual? Uh, we can't go back in time and ask those questions. And, and those questions might not even be relevant in a way because that terminology is so 20th, 21st century. And people at that time thought of their gender and sexuality in a very different way because they didn't have the same categories, the same language to think of it. Um, 
So for me, what was perhaps more fruitful and, and interesting as a scholar was to think about how did these women get represented in text? Why, for example, was the narrator of her story so sure that she had the right to dress as a man? Um, and, and why did they think it was the best way to end her story by saying that she's still wearing her regimentals? What did that say about her and her gender identity? And why did they focus on how attractive she was to other women? And in other parts of the story, Snell actually pursues relationships as part of her disguise, right? Well, well people don't, either if they're not convinced that I'm really a man, maybe I should court a woman and then they'll see that I am really a man. So the idea of how someone is represented in a text, that that might give us more kind of possibilities for reading different genders and, and sexual orientations in the past, that was really exciting to me. And that's where my book focuses, by looking at the textual representations of, of both real life women who dressed in men's clothing and their stories that were told uh, and retold in the 18th century, but also in novel representations and in other genres. So when I was thinking about the way that gender and sexuality work together in these texts, I started thinking about this idea of sapphic possibility, right? Where do the texts posit the possibility for female same-sex desires to take place, uh, to be represented? And here is yet another image of Hannah Snell. Uh, this one where she's actually in a dress, but then she's got the tricorner hat, the rifle, um, and, and a horn. Uh, to kind of represent her military service. So I thought this was another kind of interesting representation, especially since she has quite a bit of cleavage in this image. So there's a ref uh, kind of reference to this, this embodied femaleness, um, which is just an interesting, another interesting element there. So the questions that were kind of guiding my research um, was looking at texts like the story of Hannah Snell, uh, which was called The Female Soldier or The Life and or The Surprising Life and Adventures of Hannah Snell. Uh, so I was thinking about what kind of anxieties do these texts betray about women's gender roles? In other words, where is the text concerned about a woman dressing in men's clothing and what that does to her sense of self? Um, I was obviously very interested in looking at how representations between the crossdresser and other women are represented, uh, especially if there was a close relationship, some kind of friendship or, or possibly romantic relationship. Um, I was also thinking about, you know, why did these non crossdressed women react so positively to Hannah Snell? Um, and, and how do these texts make then a space for same-sex desires between women? So those are some of the, the research questions that I was thinking about uh, because I found so much evidence for kind of relationships between the cross-dresser and the non-cross-dressed women in a text. Now, I've definitely been asked in my research, you know, why do I not, why did I not write about these persons as transgender or you know, where does transgender representation fit into um, the stories of, of people like Hannah Snell? Uh, and that also led me to thinking about categories like gender fluidity or gender non-binariness, bisexuality or pansexuality. Um, and it got me really thinking, those questions got me thinking about my own investments in what I read, um, but also thinking about where does transgender representation fit into my book? And so that was one of the, the things that came up in the editorial process, thinking about you know, trans theory and the role that transgender representation plays in the representation of lesbian desire or sapphic desire. Um, so one scholar that I looked at, Noel Marshall, actually posits this term trans textuality. Um, which is a term that refers specifically to the idea of having a character dress in a different gender in order to kind of evoke same-sex desires. Um, so kind of thinking about transgender representation in the service of queer desires, which is interesting. Um, and, and kind of helped me think about how these texts are invested in using transgender representation in order to Kind of represent same-sex desires or almost it seems like a lot of the texts that I worked with seem to suggest that same-sex desires were a natural outcome of transgender representation. 
And the reason that I, I talk a lot about same-sex desire is because that's one of the, the ways that the texts themselves thought about these women. Um, the story of, of the female husband, Mary Hamilton slash George Hamilton, uh, there is an overt suggestion that it's her desires that are kind of the transgressive part of her, not her appropriation of a different gender. Um, in my work, though, I try to look beyond binaries, right? So rather than kind of posing queer versus trans or lesbian versus transgender, I try to discuss how these things might work together and how there is a multiplicity of ways of, of looking at people who dressed in a gender that does not kind of align with their sex assigned at birth. So in my book, I look at a variety of different genres um, that were popular in the 18th century. Um, part of my argument is to say, let's take a look at different genres and how do they have a pattern of representation? Where are their similarities rather than differences? So a lot of previous scholarship had looked at uh, actresses who dressed in men's clothing for parts on the stage, or they looked specifically at uh, plebeian or working class women like Hannah Snell uh, or the female pirates, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, um, or they would look just at novels and cross-dressing in novels. So in my book, I said, no, I wanna, I wanna cross over genres. So I want to cross through a lot of different vectors of interpretation and, and hence the title, right, Sapphic Crossings. And uh, this is another one of my favorite images that's in my book. Um, and it's an actress, Margaret Waffington, who's performing an epilogue in men's clothing, and it's called The Female Volunteer, or An Attempt to Make Our Men Stand. And yes, there is a little bit of a, a double entendre. So I, I do look at actress memoirs, representations of actresses, uh, as well as kind of print culture, like pamphlets and, and short stories, like and kind of mm, fictionalized biographies like Hannah Snell's, as well as novels and poetry. So I've got some more images um, as we kind of round out the, the half hour here of, of my presentation. Uh, so this is the female pirates Anne Bonny and Mary Reed who were convicted of piracy November 28, 1720. Uh, their stories are told in a kind of pirate biography publication in the early 18th century, uh, part of a genre of the criminal biography. People were really fascinated with the lives of criminals um, and how they became criminals and all the terrible things they did and then how they were punished. So in this image, they are definitely shown in, in very kind of masculine or gender neutral clothing, very kind of baggy, uh, and they were thought to be very fierce um, fighters. And, and it's fascinating because they've actually become part of popular culture today. Uh, so if anyone's watched the stars show Black Sails, uh, you'll know that Anne Bonny is actually a character on that show. Um, and there's also a video game that they both feature in and several children's books, uh, which is interesting. Um, and, and people have always been fascinated with that. And, and I'm fascinated by their stories of cross-dressing and, and kind of stealing aboard ship. As I mentioned before, um, one of the other stories that I write about, um, kind of criminal biographies, is the story of Mary Hamilton slash George Hamilton, uh, who was convicted of having married a young woman of Wells and living with her as her husband. Um, so this is one of the longer stories available in the 18th century of a person known as a female husband. Uh, so a woman, uh, or we could say a person assigned female at birth, who uh, decides to dress as a man and pass themselves off as a man and actually marries a woman, right? So of course, if they were discovered that marriage would have been rendered um, illegal and, and, and not true uh, because it was against the law, right? There was no same-sex marriage. Um, so this, this pamphlet was actually published by the renowned author Henry Fielding, who wrote uh, The History of Tom Jones and, and many plays and other novels. Um, but what's really interesting is, is that this was not an isolated publication, right? So when I did the research for the book, I found that every so often you would have little notices in British newspapers about how, you know, this man had died and he'd been living with his wife and they'd been married for 30 years and he dies and there's an autopsy and it turns out, oh, this man is a woman, 
And then the wife would be asked, you know, how did, you know, what, what was going on here? And she would say, oh, no, I don't know anything. Uh, this is, this is certainly a surprise to me. He always acted like a man to me. Um, so there is a, uh, the idea that people knew that there were instances of this happening, uh, they were aware of it, and the the sort of popularity of the story, the female husband, was certainly also a testament to how interested people were in the lives of people who were perhaps gender nonconforming um, or who had same sex desires and who would do anything to kind of gratify those desires. So the story of female husband is, is kind of written in a very satirical, salacious tone. Uh, but again, when we think of it in the larger scope of the century and all these stories over and over and over again, where um, people assigned female at birth are dressing at, in men's clothing and passing themselves off as men, either temporarily or for a much longer period of time, to me that starts to signal that there is a kind of cultural awareness of this, uh, of whether we're thinking about same-sex desires, whether we're thinking about uh, women who were kind of like proto-feminists who wanted to have more freedoms, or if we're thinking about kind of transgender identities or early forms of that, uh, that people were aware of kind of gender nonconformity and, and sexual desires that were not heteronormative. Uh, and I also looked at novels. So there's a couple uh, that novels that also have characters, uh, female characters who dress in men's clothing for various reasons. And, and again, to me, that was an, yet another sign of how well known and popular this cultural phenomenon was throughout the 18th century, so kind of crossing over the entire century and, and through different genres. Um, so I'll just finish up by just mentioning briefly how the book is organized. Um, so because I'm going across time periods and across genres, I didn't want to organize my chapters by like, you know, cross-dressing actresses, cross-dressing um, female husbands, cross-dressing female soldiers, etc. I wanted to look at something else. And because I was really interested in the idea of embodied sexuality and embodied gender, I started looking at the different body parts that were kind of critical to whether a woman could, could pass herself off as a man or not. What were the body parts that showed up over and over and over again in these stories? Um, and, and body parts specifically that played a role in identifying or confusing gender. Um, so I ended up organizing my chapters through four kind of vectors of, of body parts, right? So the first chapter is about the idea of beards, both facial hair as identifying someone as, as male, uh, but also the idea of a beard as someone who hides your true sexuality. Um, in the second chapter, I talk about breasts because there is this phenomenon where, uh, you know, the women who dress in men's clothing are constantly kind of being discovered in their gender because of their breasts rather than other body parts, which is kind of interesting. Um, the third chapter looks at genitalia and specifically penises and, and what did it mean to have to not have one and try to pass yourself off as a man uh, and also how did they kind of compensate for that. So female husbands were often thought of as uh, kind of dangerous and transgressive because uh, they would use dildos to kind of compensate for what they were missing. And so uh, that's where this image comes in. This is another image from my book and it's called The Dildo Shop. And it is a uh, frontispiece to a kind of pseudo medical text um, from 1690. And again, it makes you think like, wow, you know, we tend to think like people in the past didn't have sex toys or they weren't as kind of sexually adventurous as we are today, but that's not at all the case. Uh, so you have some quite uh, well-dressed ladies and gentlemen here who have uh, come to the dildo shop to um, look at the wares there. Uh, and then the last chapter looks at legs and that's kind of where I, I focus the discussion of actresses on stage, uh, part of the appeal of actresses on stage was that in men's clothing, they would show off their legs, which in large dresses, they wouldn't normally show off. Uh, men's legs had been sexualized for a long time with people like Henry VIII of England earlier uh, in history, having these um, you know, very uh, attractive calves. Um, but in the 18th century, we start to see kind of a discourse surrounding women's legs as being sexy, as being uh, sexualized, uh, especially if they were exposed. Um, so there's kind of a, a mixing of, of, you know, are legs masculine? Do they signal kind of feminine transgressiveness? Is there something else going on? So, um, so that's kind of the chapter breakdown.
and I'll just skip ahead here because I want to open us up to uh, discussion. So, yeah, OK, so there's, uh, you know, the book is out now and I'll pause here um, so that we can have some discussion. If you have questions, you want to hear more about some of these specific cross dressers or specific texts or um, the research or anything else that came up that you were thinking about during my talk, then then let me know. Otherwise, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, if folks have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. It says Julie says I'm raising my hand. OK, Julie, you are welcome to ask your question. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, um, I was just thinking about the fact that there were a lot of occasions where women did marry each other with one of them being cross dressed and everybody knowing it, but nobody challenging it necessarily, that there were a lot of cases like that, which I just think is really interesting, you know, just this communal acceptance of it or the officiating um, <laughs> man of cloth. Sorry, my dog just belched really loudly behind <laughs> me. Um, anyhow, um, yes, the man of cloth recording it without challenging it in any way. And I was wondering, do you deal with that at all? Did you bring that in? No, no, I am just like, I want to know more about this. I, this is one of yeah. those moments where I'm like, boy, I did so much research and it still feels like I didn't do enough. Don't you hate that? Did you, So I have another follow up question because you were talking about biology and what it means to have something or not have something. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking about Catherine Vizzani and, you know, how mm -hmm. her body was dissected and this understanding that these women engaging in frottage um, would have clitorises that would extend and would then be able to penetrate other women. Um, and then there's a, this belief, well, it's not really sex because, I mean, what could they possibly be doing because they don't have a thing there. So, and I'm going to turn my microphone off and let you or anybody else respond to that. Yeah, well, I'm so excited that you brought up Catherine Bazzani because she is part of my chapter three, where I talk about female husbands and dildos and, and penises and, and how do these uh, women kind of make up for the lack. Um, and yeah, so so with Catherine Bazzani, I mean, the it's like her life and then like, it's told by Giovanni Bianchi, this Italian doctor who knew Visani um, when they, I guess I'll say they, right, because we don't know, uh, when they were posing as Giovanni. Uh, so he knew them in real life, IRL. Uh, and then also he did the, uh, the, the autopsy after. Uh, and the frontispiece to Visani's story even says that uh, she was almost made a saint Right, because it turned out that not only did she not have an enlarged clitoris, which would have explained right her desires for other women, because that was kind of the, the thinking at the time, uh, that if you desired a woman, you must be a man, right? So um, there were these stories about people, uh, women, you know, who, or people who seemed like they were female, and then they would have an explosion of masculine heat, right? They would run too fast. And uh, their testicles would pop out and then their penis would pop out. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. oh, actually, no, it makes sense that she was into to girls because she was actually a he. We just you know, didn't know. Um, so with Visani, it's not like that, right? There's this whole thing about how like they're going to do this intense autopsy to see like, was she an intersex person? And no, not only does she have a totally normal sized clitoris, but on top of that, she was actually still a virgin. And so there's this whole thing about how she's almost made a saint by the Italian populace.
Um, but what's additionally interesting, and there's another layer there, if you're reading the English edition, um, is that John Cleland, the author of Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, or Fanny Hill, he was the translator of the English edition of Vizani's story. And there's all this editorializing by Cleland about how, well, you know, we have to really think, you know, why did she do what she did? You know, maybe she was influenced by people who told, you know, dirty stories. Um, maybe it's like a, a problem in her mind, right? So he's kind of echoing some of this discourse um, in the second half of the 18th century where we're moving from embodied kind of a sexuality that comes out of your, your sex, right? And moving into this idea that um, same-sex desire is some kind of deviance, right? That comes out of a mental defect. But again, there's another layer because it's Cleland, right? And, and Cleland was the author of Fanny Hill, uh, which was an erotic text, which certainly had its own kind of same-sex, female same-sex uh, sexual escapades. Um, and so there's a sense, and, and uh, there's another scholar whose name is escaping me right now, uh, who has already written about how probably a lot of the kind of editorializing by Cleland in that translation was really about kind of, it was kind of tongue in cheek, right? It was like maybe to pass the censors, uh, but they didn't really necessarily endorse this idea that like, oh, what she did was wrong or what he or Giovanni, right? They did was wrong. Yeah, Julie, that second spelling, V-I-Z-Z-N-I-N. A N I B I Z Z A N I. So, uh, and I'm happy to share. You know, I have I have the the kind of the copy of that from the 18th century. It's it's a fascinating story. It's not that long, so I really uh, recommend it. But yeah, thanks for letting me talk about Catherine Vazani. I could just keep going, but I'll stop there. If there's other questions. Yes, I believe Heather has a question. That was great, Ula. I'm really excited about reading the book. Um, and my question is about one of the, the texts that you mentioned, uh, Journey mm -hmm. Through Every Stage of Life. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with it. And it was interesting that on the, the title page, it says that it's, you know, based on real people, right? People of quality. And I was just wondering if there's any <laughs> intersections between, you know, novels about these, you know, gender ambiguous characters and the Romana clay. Like, is there any sense that people are outing others about their sexuality or their gender um, in the literature or is that not what's going on there? Boy, I don't know, you know, like I haven't thought about that. Um, and with the journey through every stage of life, um, you know, like that is a, it's, it's a, actually like a nested story. It's like, there's this woman who's taking care of a young lady who is like locked up in this castle and to pass the time, she tells her these stories. And the very first story is a story of Leonora and Louisa, um, and Leonora, uh, dresses in clergyman's clothing. And then later she passes herself off as a drawing master and a tutor, I believe. Um, and so, but then there's other stories that, you know, don't deal with cross-dressing at all. And, and actually, I hadn't thought about this idea that it's like Romana Clay. Um, so I, to answer your, your question, I don't know. And I, I, I hope that my book draws attention to this, this work uh, by Sarah Scott, because I think there's, there's very little written on it, actually. Um, so like Caroline Gonda has written about the story of Leonora and Louisa. Um, and I think a couple other people have written on, on a uh, journey through every stage of life but there's like volume one, there's volume two. So I'm hoping that more people will uh, will look into it because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in that for sure. And, and maybe it is a Romana Clay and I think that'd be a great research project. Thank you. Sure, thanks for that. Anyone else? Okay, I've got a question from Erica. Considering how bad back your research goes, what was the process for finding and analyzing those historical sources? So, uh, the, the, some of the sources came from a PhD level seminar on 18th century literature uh, taught by Professor Heidi Hutner at Stony Brook University, in, in which I, it was the second year of my PhD that I took that. And it was actually my very first 18th century literature class ever. <laughs> Uh, so some of the texts that we read there certainly um, were in the class, were made their way into the project. Um, and then, you know, I would go to conferences and hear people talking about texts 
Um, I actually think the story of Leonora and Louisa was one that I I was at a, a regional conference and someone was talking about this character of Leonora cross-dressing and I was like, you know, hold the boat, right? Like I need to, I need to find this, I need to read it, I need to write about it. Um, but then there were also texts that I, I thought initially I was going to use that I didn't. So in Matthew Lewis's The Monk, uh, there is a cross-dressing female character who's a monk, right? Although later it turns out she's actually the devil or a devil. <laughs> um, and so I don't know, it was kind of late and it didn't quite fit with my analysis. Her character kind of played a, a small, smaller role because you don't really know that it's a woman for a very long time. Uh, and then later it was this complication that she's actually a devil or something. So I was kind of like, ah, maybe I won't include that one. Um, so it's, it's one of those sad things where like, you have a lot, you have so much, but you cannot include everything. Um, so I would say that, you know, for, I had a core group of texts from the class and then I heard of other texts um, in, while doing the research, right? Sometimes people would write up about Hannah Snell and Christian Davies. And so that led me to find the text about Christian Davies. Um, and, and then sometimes you find stuff that you just can't include because of time or, or your own sanity. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Julia, I agree. <laughs> I think that's the greatest challenge for researchers is to know when to like know more sources like just gotta get it done and get the analysis out and you know you can continue thinking on it in future pieces. <laughs> yeah yeah well and, you know when I was kind of between I had finished my PhD and then I, I wasn't quite working on the book yet because I was working on some articles and I, I wasn't sure if I was going to get a tenure track job and so I was like well why would I work on a book if if it's, you know, if I'm not going to be, you know, having this institutional support for it. So it's kind of between things. And then finally, I did get a job that had support. And I was at ASEX, which is our annual American Society for 18th Century Studies uh, meeting. And I talked to a mentor I talked went to the, the professor is in those of you who have been to ASEX know that institution well. And I, I talked to a mentor as Chris uh, Kirsten Saxton and I, I was like well I feel like I should maybe add more texts you know I don't have enough and she was like no 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 stop just use what you have you already have a lot <laughs> so sometimes it's really helpful to have someone who's already you know been through that whole process say you know you've thought about this a lot you have a lot of evidence it's now time to to put it out because like Alicia said it's impossible to include everything so yeah yeah and I constantly have ideas, you know, I was doing this, I was doing this presentation. And I was thinking like, my God, someone needs to do an article about all the images of Hannah Snell. Like there are so many images. What does that mean? What, what does that tell us about like her representation? Um, and the other thing that's interesting too, and I'll just mention this nugget, um, which is that another interesting thing that I found in my research was that um, women who were working for the vote, the right to vote, the suffragists and suffragettes, they would uh, often have these kind of parades where they would dress up as famous women in history. And they had people who dressed up as Hannah Snell and Christian Davies, who were these women warriors from the 18th century. And I was like, boy, that is an article idea right there, right? Like how neat is that? Um, and then one other thing I'll mention, which is exciting, which is that the story of Christian Davies, who is a female soldier like Hannah Snell, it becomes retold and republished in Victorian books for children. As in like the wonders of the world. And it's like one story has like one page as a story about a big beetle in Africa. And then the next page is a story about this 18th century woman warrior. And then the next one has, you know, something else, right? So that that's also fascinating. Yeah. Okay, and Ayuk, that is a question. You talked about the concept of a beard within language in terms of sexuality, as well as a physical symbol of masculinity it holds. Did you find any other terms that are used similarly? <laughs> well, yes, yes. So in the chapter about breasts, um, each chapter actually, I start each chapter with kind of a short, Kind of cultural history of that body part in the 18th century um, and so as i was thinking about breasts in the 18th century i was thinking also about 
breast and bosom, right? And how actually in, in the 18th century, both of those words could be used for men as well as for women. Um, so this idea that the breast was uh, a metaphorical space within which all your feelings are located, right? So with Hannah Snell, like she had the real soul of a man in her breast. He's not talking about like a breast, like a boob. <laughs> He's talking about her breast as in this like metaphorical space within which we have our feelings, which I thought was was really interesting. And, and bosom worked in a similar way. It could be an embodied part of, of someone's body, but it could also be this kind of metaphorical I don't know, part of your soul almost. Uh, so that was interesting to me that like this term, which today, right, is not used in a kind of gender neutral way at all, right? Uh, in fact, people who are non-binary or transgender um, who nurse their children call it chest feeding, right? To avoid that term breastfeeding because it seems so gendered to us today. But in the 18th century, you have a lot of textual evidence suggesting that actually that's not at all the case you definitely have people using the word breast to discuss, you know, the, the, the way someone is feeling, whether they're male or female. So that was kind of interesting to, to see like that metaphorical resonance for both breast and beery. So thank you for that question. Uh, any other questions or comments or things you want to hear more about? Um, did I see any kind of censoring of these texts in my research? Um, you know, no, because all the texts that I was using were ones that were being circulated in, in throughout, I mean, in some cases throughout the 18th century. Uh, so in, in the chapter, in chapter three about penises and dildos, I have a section about dildo poetry, um, because it was another way that I was kind of arguing that people were aware of what dildos were and, and that they were out there <laughs> and the people were using them and they were there for the taking. Um, and so the, the poems by, for example, the Earl of Rochester, uh, who writes about a character called Signor Dildo, obviously a gentleman from Italy. Um, <laughs> So that that poem is republished uh, several times throughout the 18th century in, in these cl collections of poems. And there's I didn't see any sign of any kind of censorship. Um, so, yeah, um, I actually I don't write about the Chevalier d'Anne, uh, Julie. Thank you for that question. Um, again, it was it was a text that or actually I, I only heard of them, I'll say they for, for the Chevalier, only heard of them when I was already done with like the main draft of the of the text. Um, and also because I had been focusing primarily on people assigned female at birth, but I definitely want to learn more about the Chevalier down for sure. That's definitely on my to do list, my research to do list my ever-growing <laughs> research to-do list. Um, any other questions? Still have some time. Questions or comments? Agree. And the Chevalier really deserves a lot of space. It's a fascinating story. Yeah, Arnie. Hi, did you at all write about um, the opposite of men dressing as women or that, that was a whole other book in itself? Yeah, yeah, I kind of cut myself off. I was like, that's a whole nother thing. And that kind of came out of my investment in looking at lesbian desire specifically. Um, I think that, you know, and also thinking about that I started this project 10 years ago and the field of transgender studies has been developing so quickly that the resources that we have now in transgender studies, especially when we're thinking about 18th century studies, um, they're completely different now. There's so much coming out now that, you know, 10 years ago when I was writing my dissertation, um, there wasn't as much as far as like thinking about transgender identities in the past, right? Uh, there was a lot about transgender identities in the 20th century, 21st century, um, and, and so it, it, 
I didn't find my way to that research until I was doing the revisions for this book. Um, and then I was kind of thinking more critically like, well, you know, actually transgender studies has a lot to offer. Um, because what I actually don't remember the name of the scholar, it might be Susan Stryker who talks about, or no, I think it's Jolene Zigarovich actually. She says that um, trans does to gender what queer did to desire um, or sexual identity. So I'm thinking that that the whole field of, of gender studies is right now undergoing a, a phenomenal shift. So, so maybe that it's you know just if, I think that a, a PhD student now could certainly write about lesbian desire and the Chevalier d'Anne, right, in a way that I couldn't think of it that way ten years ago. So, I think that's that's one of the exciting things about how the field is moving and developing. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? That was a great question. Thank you. So what's next? What's your next list item on your uh, research to do list? <laughs> um, well, so I just presented at the Southeastern American Society for 18th Century Studies, and I presented about the idea of transgender citizenship in Afroban's 1689 play, The Widow Ranter. So I, I think I want to, to kind of follow up with that and turn that into an article. Um, and then I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the next book project will be on the idea of queer tourism. Um, I just, and of course, this idea was conceived pre-pandemic, right? I was like, oh, if I do queer tourism, then I can like travel to do my research, and, like immersive research. Um, so fingers crossed that that can start happening again, maybe next year. Um, but basically, I, you know, I do a lot of literary tourism when I travel. I go to places that authors lived, where they wrote, where they visited. Um, and, and my wife loves doing that too, and she's a modernist. So uh, a couple years ago, we were in England and we went to Knoll, which is Vita Sackville West's ancestral home. Um, and, and she was the lover of Virginia Woolf. And so we kind of walked around, kind of like trying to like channel the ghosts of uh, Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West. Um, and while I was there, there was a placard that was like, oh, in the 18th century, Horace Walpole came here. And I was like, wait, what? So because Knoll is like, I mean, it, it dates from, I think, the late 15th century and it's been around for a long time, it means it was actually a tourist destination for a very long time. And so it kind of got me thinking about how, um, you know, how are queer people like Horace Walpole, who's queer in various ways, um, how are they functioning as tourists? But then also Vita Sackville West's home as kind of like a, a place that she grew up in and she was actually a tour guide for people who would visit the house and they wanted to see the Tudor rooms and she would take them around and be a little tour guide for them. Um, so, so thinking kind of about different ways of queer tourism. And, and so my research question for that is to, to kind of excavate the sort of central role that queer people played in the development of tourism as an, as an idea, um, as a kind of social activity. So I'm hoping that that'll take me to some pretty neat places um, in addition to the ones I've already been to. So yeah, so that's that's the plan. Um, just need this pandemic to end. Julie, my hope is to do, no, but I'm not gonna say that, to include Ann Lister. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, gonna do Ann Lister in the next book. Wait a minute, no. Um, I'm gonna work on Ann Lister um, with the queer tourism um, project. That's my hope. I actually just bought the new edition of her diaries. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, this, the show Gentleman Jack on HBO, um, that is about Ann Lister, who was a wealthy landowner in the early uh, 19th century in the north of England. And some people call her the first modern lesbian. Although again, that term has been disputed and some people are saying, well, maybe she was transgender, gender non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer. Uh, we don't know. Or maybe if she's her own thing. Um, and I do know that she actually visited the ladies of Klangothlin, um, Eleanor Butler and Sarah Ponsonby, who are these two women, cousins, friends, maybe something else, who lived together uh, in the 18th century in Wales. It's this idea that like queer people can be tourist destinations and queer people can be tourists. 
Um, so that that kind of got her on my radar for this new project. So I'm really excited to uh, to dig into that. Um, so I, my hope is to yes to to uh, to work on Ann Lister uh, in the next project as part of this project on queer tourism. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about that. I actually haven't finished Gentleman Jack season one because it got kind of sad and depressing. And I was like, no, not sad queers. I'm so tired of sad queers. But I know it, I know it ends up happily. So, um, yeah. And when I was in York, I guess two years ago, I did see the placard, the plaque they put up in the, the place where she and um, her partner and took their vows to each other. So that was exciting. Well, you have a couple minutes left. I know Alicia posted um, a event evaluation um, and a link to our other events. So definitely check that out. Um, and there's a link a little bit further in the chat about to get notified if you want to get the book from the bookstore here on campus. Um, but I do have time for maybe one more question or comment if anyone has one. A burning question. Burning research question. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for coming and for all your your questions and comments and your attention. I know there's a lot going on. There's a lot of talks happening. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for making it out to mine. Thank you for all the lovely comments in the in the chat too. You're very welcome. So excited to be able to share with you all. Thank you.